大家好，好好乖乖。Um, yeah, my Chinese is terrible. Um, but、uh, hey, good to be here. I I look forward to this conference because,、um, as some of you may know, I grew up in a Chinese church, and. For years, as a kid, this is—I'm very thankful for those times. I built great friendships during those times.、Uh, it was then that I was exposed to Jesus.、Um, at the same time, there was a frustration in me because I felt like there was so much more that was available to us. I, I felt like, gosh, Lord, I, when I read the Bible, it seems like there's so much more power available to us, and I just felt like God had big plans for my life. And a lot of times, I didn't even know how to express that in the church. I didn't feel like anyone really understood me. It, it, it's kind of like、um, a few weeks ago, I was in Brazil, and I, I was having lunch with a pastor out there, and he's a, a Korean guy. And but his church in Brazil is not just Koreans. Most Korean churches are all Koreans, but in this church they they had they had actual Brazilians, Portuguese speaking, and they had mixed services. and And I was seeing all these creative things. So I said to him, I go, man, it's really cool seeing what you're doing as a church. How focused you are on missions and this and that. And he looked at me. He goes, yeah. He goes, but it still feels kind of like a zoo. And he goes, you know what I mean by that? He goes, he goes, have you ever seen the movie Madagascar? And I go, yeah. <laughs> have you seen the movie Madagascar? It's 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 a great movie. It's it's a this cartoon about this the, these zoo animals, and and the the scene starts off with a zebra, and he's running on a treadmill. While he's looking at this picture, this painting of the jungle, and he's running on his treadmill, dreaming of being in the jungle. Meanwhile, it's his birthday, so the hippo and the giraffe and the lion all come into his cage and and、uh, celebrate his birthday. And he's just going, "I got to get out of here. I want to be in the wild. I want to be in the jungle." And 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 it's the whole story is about these animals trying to convince them, no, don't go, don't go, you know. And the lions kind of going, man, why would you go out there, man? Here I sit in a cage and people bring me meat. How can it get any better? But the zebra is like, oh no, I gotta get out of it. See, when this pastor was saying was, man, he says our church is so much like that. Where it just feels like a big zoo, where you've got these animals, and the only way they know how to survive is someone comes and they feed them. Meanwhile, you know, in the in the story, you've got the the zebra who's like, "I gotta get out, I gotta get out," and all these other animals are like, "No, let's stay in our cages. It's safe here." But if you watch the movie, you see eventually the the animals escape the zoo with help from the penguins, and、uh, and they end up on this island. And it's such a great scene because, you know, the 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 zebra is trying to tell the lion, "Come on, run with me, run!" No, you know, and he's used to you know prancing on two feet. He goes, "No, use all fours." And then this lion starts roaring. As he runs, and suddenly, suddenly, all of his animal instincts are coming out, and then he starts biting the zebra, you know. And it's just this. But he he was saying it's such a great picture of the church, where you have these people that have so much power inside of them. But all we want to do is keep them in these cages, and pretty soon they just feel like this is the only way I can survive is if someone feeds me. And I think so often in the church, that's exactly what we do. We set up these cages and we say, "Okay, let's have a children's ministry cage. Let's have a youth ministry cage. Make that one really strong. You know, let's 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 do a singles cage. Let's do a young marrieds cage. You know, and you know, let's, let's do a Chinese cage, a Mandarin cage, a Cantonese cage. You know, let's just put everyone in their cages and let's just feed them every week. And our whole job is just to keep feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you." 
when the reality is, is you were made for something more. And some of you know that. Like there's something in you that says, man, I don't want to just go on a mission trip. I want to just go somewhere. I want to risk my life. I want to see the power of God. Man, I felt like I was that, that lion inside that cage in the Chinese church sometimes growing up. Like, I want to get out of here. Like there's something more that I was destined for. And so it was exciting to me to hear this year about your theme, about being unleashed, you know, about let's get these people out of this cage. Let's start believing that they can actually do more. And with this, uh, the theme of raising and releasing the next generation of kingdom builders, that's something that is such a strong conviction of mine. Man, we expect great things from our kids. Because I remember what it was like when people didn't expect much from me. And that's not a great way to live. That's not what we're designed for. We're like those animals that know deep inside we don't belong in these cages. There's something so much more. On, on Christmas Eve, um, I became a grandfather. Had my first grandkid. Yeah, it's huge. That's really big. I've got seven children, and so that's my oldest, that's my first grandchild, and uh, I couldn't be more excited about the future of her life as she married an amazingly godly man who's gonna lead her into some crazy adventures, I know it. And they're gonna risk, they'll risk their lives for the gospel, and I'm excited about that. And yet, I've got other kids. You know, I have one that's off to college, a couple in college, and then a couple that are in middle school. And um, my middle school kids are in public school, and uh, the other week, they, um, they brought their science teacher to church. And so I asked the science teacher, I'm like, hey, what, what brought you here? And he says, well, first day of class, he goes, I have the kids fill out a survey. And the last question on the survey is, is there anything else I should know about you? And he says, your daughter wrote, you need to know that I'm a Christian and that I don't care what you say about evolution, I won't believe it. <laughs> I was like, wow, all right. She goes, you know, and I've got your son in another class and you know, in his, it was like, hey, who's your mentor? He goes, man, there are so many godly men in my church, I don't even know which one to pick. And he goes, so here I am in a public school looking at these two answers and going, who are these kids? They're both chans, you know, and then, you know, I, I brought your daughter into my, my class, you know, I, I pulled her up to, my, to, to me in class one day, I'm like, hey, I saw what you wrote. And uh, he goes, about evolution, he goes, I'm not even sure I know what to teach regarding evolution. You know, he goes, I'm a Christian. He goes, I'm a Christian too, and I don't know how to teach evolution. And he says, your daughter looked at me and said, don't worry, Mr. Hom, we'll figure something out. <laughs> I go, yeah, that's my girl. You know, it's just, it's just so cool. To, it's, it's all about releasing. Man, we have this gal in our church, and right now she's running a ministry where they are discipling over a quarter million children in Africa every week a quarter million of these children who are going to these unreached people groups. The kids are going in. They don't even know very much about the gospel. They hear that God can heal and they start walking in and they start healing these people that are believing all these pagan rituals. They, they've been in villages where they're still sacrificing children in this fire, in this giant kiln in the middle of the village but it's these kids that are going on and reaching them. And uh, she uh, asked the question one day, she says, hey, when do your children receive the Holy Spirit of God? At what age? I'm like, 
I don't know, I guess whenever they believe. And they said, well, she says, well, when they receive the Holy Spirit, what, what do they get? Do they get the whole Holy Spirit or do they get like a Holy Spirit junior till they turn 18? You know, she, she goes, so when do they get their spiritual gift? When, when, when are they able to bless the body? Isn't what, that, what Matthew 18 is all about when Jesus bring the kids to me? But we want to keep them in their own separate little cage and just kind of protect them and keep them safe when they have incredible power in them. And I've seen that in my children, the power they have, the influence they have. I remember being in high school and You know, I couldn't bring my friends to my Chinese church because they didn't speak Chinese and they were all white. And so I took them to a different church and I went to a different youth group. And I, you know, I mean, one night the youth pastor picked me up in the church bus and we picked up 50 of my friends, 50, and took them to youth group because I'm looking at my friends in high school going, man, I don't want them to go to hell. I gotta bring them somewhere. And so we have to start thinking, okay, what if there are some of you young people who are in your school and you're going, man, I've got to get my friends. I've got to save them. I've got to do something. How do we release them? What are we doing as churches? How are we encouraging that? Or do we want to just keep them in their cage? Are we really serious about releasing the next generation of kingdom builders? There's a passage that has been um, so on my mind. Uh, I've been looking at it for the last year. It's in Ephesians chapter one where Paul is praying for the Ephesians. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And listen to this. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Paul is praying for these believers. And he says, God, would you open up the eyes in their heart? Not just make them do the right things, nothing just superficial externally. He goes, I want the eyes of their heart enlightened so that deep inside they really know. He says, I want them to know the hope to which they've been called. And we don't have time to get into all of these things, you know, and, and I want them to know the, but you know, but, it, but it's, it's, it's just basically, I want them to know what this eternity is all about. You know, like in, in Corinthians, when he says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed that to us by his spirit. He goes, God, open up the eyes of their hearts so they just know the hope the future, they understand eternity. He goes, also open up the eyes of the heart so they can know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Get it to where they understand that God cannot wait to inherit his saints. But then he makes this statement, this is the one I wanna believe, and even as I read it to you, everything in my heart's going, Francis, do you believe this right now? Do you believe this right now? What is the immeasurable, listen to these words, immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? The immeasurable greatness of his power 
toward us who believe. Immeasurable greatness of power. It's such a crazy concept to me because all my life I've had limits, right? Like, I remember trying out for high school basketball and I got cut. I thought, man, but I'm better than my Chinese friends. It's just you guys are so big. You know, like, I just remember, no matter what, I just couldn't match up. I couldn't make it. It bugged me. And I I just, even, like, I have limitations. No matter how hard I try, I'm not going to make the NBA. Right? I'm 50 years old. I'm not going to, I have physical limitations. I'm not going to make the Olympics. Even if, if, even if that's all I did, except maybe like luge or curling or, you know, whatever. But, you know, it's all those weird sports that anyone could do. But other than that, I have these physical limitations in the same way. Like, I don't, I, my mind, you know, I, I remember being tested as a kid. You know how they have, uh, I think they call it gate programs now for the, the kids that, do they still have that? Is that what it's called, gate or? Okay, how many were in gate? Yeah, everyone, okay. Well, I didn't make it in, okay? Okay, we, I remember as a kid just thinking, man, I've got this. I didn't make it in. Man, I just remember different classes when, when I just couldn't understand things and I just didn't match up. So I'm used to, you know what, I'm not quite fast enough. I'm not quite athletic enough. I'm not quite smart enough. Both of my sisters were 4.0s, you know? And, and I wasn't. You know, I just, I couldn't match up in so many ways. And so you're used to just not measuring up. Then you read a verse like this that says that what God gives to you, and he says, man, I want them to believe it from their heart, the immeasurable, immeasurable. There's no limit. You can't even measure the greatness of power toward us. He, in fact, he goes, let me give you an example of how much power is available to you. It's, 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 it's according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in the right hand. He goes, you want an example of the power that he gives to you? He goes, picture the dead body of Jesus Christ here. Okay, he's, been, he's just been tortured. He's been torn apart, and now he's bleeding. You know, he was crucified, stabbed on the side, and he's just as dead as a body gets. You can't even recognize him as a man anymore. He says, you know the power that God used to not just raise him from the dead? But he goes, he raised him all the way up and seated him on his right hand, far above, what is the words? Seated him, seated him at his right hand, the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. He says, God took a dead body a mutilated body, and he raised him all the way up to heaven, far above everything else. Satan's not even close. The demons aren't even, he's far above all rule and authority, and he gave him the name that's above every name, and that's not just for now. He says it's forever and ever and ever. He took a dead, mutilated body, put it all the way up there, and then he says there's an example of the type of power that he puts toward you. It's immeasurable, this immeasurable greatness of power. And that's why Paul's on his knees going, God, I wish these people would understand what they're capable of. 
Do they understand the immeasurable greatness of his power? Do they understand whether you did with Jesus as one picture of that power that's inside of you? It's inside of your kids. If they believe in Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit, here's this, this raging lion roaring to get out. And yet so often in the church, we're like, let's protect them. Let's, put, let's protect this lion, put him in a nice little cage, and let's just feed him for the rest of his life. And God wants so much more. He wants so much more for us. I mean, do we really believe what he says a few verses later in, in chapter three, verse 20? It's one that we quote a lot, but do we believe it now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us? When you pray, when you close your eyes, do you really pray to one where you go, God, you could do more than I could ask or imagine according to the power at work within us. Man, do you believe that? Because I tell you, I get voices in my head, voices whispering in my ear, telling me all of my limitations. Voices that try to make me nervous every time I get up onto a stage. Voices that tell me, why even bother speaking? These people aren't going to change. Voices from hell itself. And I have to say, that's not true. There's a measurable power, a measurable greatness of power toward me right now. He could do more than I could ask or even think according to the power at work in me. I could give a message, read the scriptures, and because the scriptures are this powerful, there's some of you in this room right now that the eyes of your heart are being enlightened. You don't need someone else's permission. You hear the word of God and something in you is going, man, I knew it. I knew it. I believe God can do these amazing things. And I realize as a parent that for me, I've believed this about myself. Man, I I always took the word of God literally. I really did. Even when no one else did. When I was in high school and I started reading this book and I, I, I started hearing that, wow, by faith you could move mountains. That if I have faith, I could move mountains. I remember going back in my room and just closing the door and trying to move stuff. I promise you I did, and I just thought, I'm going to try to move that paper right now. And I would just stare at it. You know, just lighter things I thought would be easier. You know, pencil, just make a roll. I mean, just anything. I mean, you know, and and I don't know, I still feel like one day I'm going to do it. But I'd look at that, and I'd go, no, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And I'm learning more and more about his power and I'm seeing miracles happen and supernatural answers to prayer. And as that happened more and more in my life, I started believing this more and more. But I realized something happened to me when I became a parent. There was this struggle of just wanting to protect my kids rather than release them. See, like I trusted God for myself, but there were times when I was just afraid for my children. And I wouldn't apply these passages. I would say, well, that applies to dad, and wait till you turn 18. And yet the truth is, is there's tremendous power in our children. In fact, there's a faith in them. That's why I told my pastors, I said, look, If I had cancer right now, I'd rather have my 12-year-old son pray for me than a 40-year-old man. 
because kids have greater faith. In fact, Jesus says, unless we change and humble ourselves and become like children, unless we have this faith like a child, we're not even going to enter the kingdom of heaven. See, while I've grown in some areas, man, the fight for faith, it feels like that's an area we can decline in. That's why we need the children in our lives. I mean, seriously, if I had cancer right now, I would grab the kids. I really would. And I would grab the kids, I'd go, you guys, pray for me, because I know you believe, you believe that you could pray for me right now, and I could convince my, my 12-year-old son, look, you could change, you could get rid of the cancer in dad right now by praying to God because you have that kind of faith. I could convince him to pray with total faith a lot faster than I could teach a 40-year-old man. And what if we release the kids in the church to say, hey, kids, come, would you lay hands on this couple? They're thinking about divorce. Why don't you pray for Mr. and Mrs. Wong? You know, like, and imagine a bunch of eight, 10 year old kids laying hands on you and saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, God, would you change their hearts? This fighting is just awful. What if we release this army of children to start praying because they're the ones that are reaching the people in Africa. But I know how it can be in a Chinese culture. We can take our kids and go, you know what, just study for now. You know, get good grades. We'll do missions later. We'll do ministry later. And I just wonder if we have not missed out on some of the people who have the greatest amount of faith in the church. And if we missed out on the power of their prayer because we wanted to keep them in a cage so they were 18, rather than really releasing, raising and releasing the next generation of kingdom builders. But one of the things I've learned now that I'm a grandfather and have been raising kids for a while I realize that your kids will eventually find out the truth about you. You know, they know if you really even believed about yourself that there's this immeasurable greatness of power towards you. They'll look at your life and go, man, did you really take those risks? Did you really believe you had that power? And what does it do to them? When scripture says one thing about them, and you say another, and saying, well, that doesn't apply to you yet. Or do you teach your kids, you know what, you have immeasurable, immeasurable greatness of power. His divine power, man, he's given you everything you need for life and godliness. See, the church was about increasing It's about light penetrating the darkness. It's about this force, this church, that the gates of hell could not stand against. I know you've heard it before, but we're on offense and the gates of hell, the gate is not an offensive weapon. We're on offense and we're pushing down these gates. And yet that's not usually the way we raise our kids. We're just putting them inside the gate and trying to protect them. Instead of teaching them, no, you've got a measurable greatness of power. Do you understand how great he who is in you is? He's greater than anything out in the world. To teach our kids, you know what, you've got this power to actually cultivate that faith. Rather than so many times, don't we squash the faith of our children? that may believe for big things. See, I'm fighting, fighting, fighting for that childlike faith. See, they can see it in you. Do you believe it about yourself? Something I've learned is that you can't unteach your example. You can't unteach your example. It doesn't matter what you say to your kids. They'll remember who you are, 
who you were, whether you really lived by faith. You know, in First Peter, I was reading this verse the other day. Um, I think it's First First Peter one. Um, yeah, verse eight. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Look at that past. You, you haven't seen him, but you love him. And though you don't see him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory. Wait, you rejoice with joy. Look at these adjectives. Joy that's inexpressible. That's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to have a joy that's inexpressible. Like, I'm so stinking happy. There's no words. I just say stinking. Like, it's just like this joy. It's just like, ah, my life is so good. It's so good because I know him. Like, do your kids see this joy welling up in you because you're filled with the Spirit? Man, I mean, you can tell them, oh, Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And I get, but do they see that in you? The Bible says that you could have a peace that's beyond comprehension. Are you catching these adjectives? It's beyond comprehension. It's a joy that's inexpressible. It's a power that's immeasurable. So it's immeasurable, incomprehensible, inexpressible. See, that's the way we are supposed to be as believers. When God says, be holy as I am holy, that doesn't mean just don't swear. And don't drink and don't have sex before you're married. Sure, it can include those things. But when he says be holy, he goes, I want you to be completely different, like set apart from the rest of the world. The rest of the world does not have a joy that they can't contain. The rest of the world does not have immeasurable greatness of power. The rest of the world does not have peace that's beyond comprehension. And that's why Paul's on his knees saying, God, Make them believe this in their heart. I want to show my kids a man who's never afraid. I want to show them a guy who's never stressed out. I want to show them a guy that's just full of joy and life and nothing's going to get me down. And I want to show them a guy who actually believes there's an immeasurable greatness of power in me. Then I can speak to people and their lives will change. That I can preach in front of you and through the power of the Holy Spirit, who knows what he's gonna release in this room. I wanna believe that. I wanna be the example for my children because we can release them, but have we been that example? Because they can see right through it. You guys, this is not at all, I hope this, uh, doesn't come across like a condemning thing or whatever else to you because maybe you haven't been that example to your kids. Maybe you haven't even believed that they have any power in themselves. My hope is we can turn things around and we start releasing and seeing some great things happen because as most of you know, the Chinese churches in America are dying You know, so many of them are just trying to keep their doors open and make budget. And that's not what God has destined for us. Just to be in survival mode? Is that what you get out of this book? That we're just survivors? Because what I read is that I'm an overcomer of this world. And what I read is I've got crazy amount of power in me and a crazy amount of joy and courage, it's all there, a divine power. But I gotta ask you tonight, 
Do you believe that about yourself? Because just like what we may do to our kids, maybe someone's been doing that to us our whole lives, telling us that we've got limitations. And it's true, we have some physical limitations. Some of us have some mental limitations. But the Bible says that through the Spirit, it's endless what we could do. Things that we can't even imagine right now. We're capable in our heart. And this is where we have to believe what God says. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not like your ways. He goes, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above yours. I have to remind myself of that verse that what God thinks of me is different than what I think of me. See, I can look in the mirror and go, man, I, I'm not smart enough. I'm not a good enough leader. I, I see other guys lead and they do so much better. You know, and I take tests and I try to, you know, sound smart. I just can't do it. And I just think, I can't amount to anything great. And God says, look, stop listening to your own thoughts. Stop believing everything you think. My thoughts are so much higher than yours. And something I, God revealed to me this year is that I'm very good at taking, I'm not very good. I'm pretty good at taking his commands seriously but I'm not very good at taking his promises seriously. You know, Isaiah 66 verse two says, this is the one to whom I'll look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. And I realized I'm good at trembling at his commands. Like if he commands something of me, I'm like, okay, don't do that. Okay, I won't do that. Don't do that. Okay, I won't do that. Like I I take it seriously. I'll tremble at his commands, but I don't tremble at his promises. It's almost like the good things, the things that he's promised me, I don't tremble at that and believe. Like when he says, look, I can do more than you can ask or imagine. According to the power of work in you, do I tremble at that? Go, God said that, I better believe it. He says there's an immeasurable greatness toward me because I believe. I better tremble at his word. He just said that about me. So forget what I've thought about myself. Forget what you think about me or anyone else that's going to put limitations on me. Here's what God thinks of me. And I have to shut myself up and my own feelings and go, you know what? God says I've got crazy amount of power. That's why I've even told God recently, like, I don't want to die yet. I'm not afraid to die, but I just don't want to die yet. Okay? I'm 50. My parents didn't live this long. They never made it to 50. They barely made it to 40. I go, God, but I feel like there's just, I'm just now starting to believe the power that's available to me. I'm going, God, just give me a few more years because I don't believe I completed the work you gave me to do and I want to go after it. I'm so excited about 2018. I'm like, God, what do you have for me? Because I just believe in this power. And what do you have for my children? Because I want to see them transform their campuses, and I believe they can do it. There's just a unique time that we have, and the time is ticking. I'm looking at this clock, 22 seconds left, you know, and I think, gosh, that's the way our life is. Tick, 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 and before we know it, we're in the presence of God, and that's why I want to be faithful to his word, and I pray that you will be too. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus 
Thank you so much for Jesus. Without him, I would not dare speak to you and come into your presence. It's only by his blood and because of his blood I come before you with confidence. And Lord, please, I pray that you would enlighten the eyes of the hearts of individuals in this room. Please, Father, open the eyes of their hearts. Make it internal where they actually believe the power that's available to them. And God, I pray for repentance. Please, Lord, may this not be just another sermon where people get convicted and nothing changes. Please, God. Please, Father. Give them the boldness, the courage to repent, to change. Pray that some parents would go back to their kids and apologize for squashing their faith. And I pray that young people would rise up. I pray that we'd believe your word and we'd see what you did through kids throughout history and believe that it could happen with our own. Father, take away our fear. Make us people that are fearless, full of joy, full of peace, full of faith in your power. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.